Sakura's got potential, so let's release it. Thanks to a conversation I had with comments in my last video, I have to add a qualifier here. I'm only referring to canonical events of the anime and manga for story and character direction. Any peripheral content, such as light novels, will be excluded, even if they too are considered canon. Here's a short recap of what we covered last time. Sakura realizes in the Land of Waves that she's nowhere near as good as she thought she was. Sakura unlocks a weird technique while going through the Chunin exams. Disappointed in Kakashi, her teacher, she pursues another teacher in Tsunade of the Sanin. She's invited to this training by Tsunade before Sasuke even leaves the village as a means of bolstering her confidence. During the Sasuke retrieval arc, Sakura begins using this new technique on purpose, but hasn't had time yet to train it. At the end of part 1, Sakura has turned her back on Kakashi as Team 7's combined failures has shattered any trust she had in it. So I think this one will be split into a few parts. The reason for this is now we have our foundation set in, I can jump into the meat and focus on big changes that have to occur before the final arc of the series. Remember, spoiler warning folks, I know Naruto has long finished, but there are still new youngsters who haven't experienced its majesty yet. Far be it from me to ruin that enjoyment. Finally, before we begin in earnest, let me give a couple heads up. You will notice several things that are far different from canon material. Ultimately, the conclusion of all my arcs are intended to stay the same, just with the action in between being changed. I've not named Sakura's Kekegenkai, but here's the general direction I'm going with it. Karin is a member of the lost Uzumaki clan. As such, like Naruto, she has tremendous chakra reserves all on her own. With this chakra, she has developed a way to quickly heal others of their wounds, and for some odd reason, this involves biting her. Remember that much later in the story, Karin even heals Tsunade from death's door to fully healed and fine in seconds. I didn't want Sakura's Kekegenkai to eclipse everything Karin can do, because that would simply invalidate a character. Although Karin's also a sensory-type ninja, that wasn't enough for me to simply overlap their abilities. No, Karin has an incredible life force, as all Uzumakis do. So for me, if she uses chakra sourced from her life force, she's immediately distinct from Sakura. Sakura's Kekegenkai allows her to give and take chakra. It is not inherently a force for healing. She happens to be able to turn that force into healing, but it doesn't translate instantly into healing like Karin's does. In part 1, I had Sakura use it incidentally several times in close range with others because she didn't have any time to hone it. But now she's had over two years to work out all the kinks. Therefore, Sakura can now use it at limited range. I was thinking something like a stone's throw for distance, with it waning in consistent power the farther she stretches it. However, she remains at maximum efficiency when in direct contact. She can weaken and sometimes dispel another's ninjutsu and can altogether absorb chakra that's plainly available. Sakura begins training Tsunade's Byakugo seal at the start of the time skipping canon. It takes her three years until nearly the end of the fourth ninja war before it finishes building. This is too long. I love how part two starts, because it lands us right back in the training grounds where we get to see how much our main characters have improved. It is not controversial to say that Naruto doesn't change much during the time skip. Uh, let's see here, he's gotten older. Oh, and I guess he also has a bigger Rasengan. Well, unfortunately for Naruto, I'm not doing this rewrite for his sake. So nothing on his part really changes here. But Sakura and Tsunade have been training very hard in the last two years. Harder than Sakura has ever trained in her life. She already has her Byakugo seal on her forehead. She even wears her forehead protector at first in order to cover it. Thanks to her Keke Genkai, she was able to absorb, store, and fortify her chakra far faster. However, this seal will remain as is for now. Sealed and continually building power. And training aside, Tsunade has been sending Sakura to assist other teams in missions all this time as well. Kakashi initiates the start of the training session by vanishing into thin air. Sakura yanks Naruto behind some bushes while she ascertains where he could be hiding. While they're in the bushes, she turns to Naruto and tells him to make a lot of clones, and to keep them hidden in the bushes around the clearing to wait for her signal. No reason to argue, Naruto does so as Sakura cautiously reveals herself. Winding back, she punches the ground, having figured out that this is the last place Kakashi could be hiding. 
As his body appears from amongst the rubble, stunned by her newfound monstrous strength, all of Naruto's clones spring from the bushes. Naruto is a clumsy fighter, at least against those with solid taijutsu. Always the professional, Kakashi leaps from the rocks, regains his composure, and begins fending off the army of Naruto's. He notices while fighting the swarm that some are simply running in for an attack, while others are diving specifically for the bells. It impresses Kakashi. Naruto has issues throwing more than one or two clones at a time, even in such a large-scale attack. So the idea that he has diverted the attention of some to the bells is certainly some growth. A poof of smoke from behind Kakashi as one of the clones transforms into Sakura and swings one of her dangerous fists in his direction. The swing is poorly aimed, and Kakashi suspects for a moment that it's Naruto that has transformed into Sakura, not the other way around. But her fist brushes the side of his vest and blasts a few scrolls from pockets, his tool bag goes flying, and most importantly, the bells go free, and he realizes Sakura has been hiding amongst the clones as Naruto. As the bells fall free, Kakashi attempts to die for them, but discovers Sakura has gotten her arms around him in the instant that he was distracted and he can't overpower her. Though he thinks to do a substitution to escape, it's too late. Two Naruto's stand in front of him with a bell each. One of them transforms back into Sakura. In just minutes, the training comes to a close as Naruto and Sakura stand victorious. Naruto could barely tell what was happening, but he's happy all the same that they got the bells. Meanwhile, Kakashi and Jiraiya are blown away. Did Tsunade find some hidden genius and disguise her as Sakura, or is this Shizune transformed? Only Shikamaru should have had the wherewithal to come up with the strategy so quickly. So a quick intermission here. I don't have her use fancy tricks here because of what happens very soon after. Also, Kakashi actually underestimates her. It's not that she outmaneuvered Kakashi, but more that she surprised him and it only took an instant of distraction to claim the bells. Additionally, I thought one-sided teamwork would be another indication as to how Sakura's grown. Naruto's been training essentially by himself, but Sakura's been going out on missions with a wide variety of people, so she's learned to adapt her teammate skills to her own. While the original story of revealing spoilers from Jiraiya's newest book was funny, what I've always wanted from this exercise was to be impressed. And quite frankly, Sakura simply didn't deem using her additional abilities as necessary given the legion of Naruto's she could use for cover. I feel the need to emphasize how much Sakura's done in the last two-ish years. Like Shikamaru, Choji, and Ino, she's been consistently going on missions with other teams. She's also gone on special missions with Shizune and other more experienced Jonin. They've attained their bells, and Naruto goes to Jiraiya to brag about his quick victory, but Sakura stays behind to speak with Kakashi. She tells him that a lot has changed in the last two years, and even though he's been around to see some of her growth, there are still depths that no one has ever seen. She agrees to work with him in any way it takes to get Sasuke back, and that she can't let frustrations of the past distract her from what she seeks to achieve. Nonetheless, Kakashi gets the distinct impression that she still hasn't fully forgiven him. It's one thing to say past is past, quite another to actively move past it. When news reaches Konoha of Gara's fall to the Akatsuki, Team 7 head out immediately, with Sakura staying behind for just a few moments to exchange a few last words with Tsunade. Just as originally, Sakura cures Konkuro of the deadly poison dealt by Sasori, impressing all the medical ninja of the Sand Village, including Lady Chio. On the spot, she shares with them the cure she's found using several of their local herbs to create further doses more easily. When they set out and are intercepted by Itachi Uchiha, Sakura grits her teeth. She knows who Itachi is now, and almost feels Sasuke's phantom hatred course through her. Kakashi warns her to stay away and not make eye contact with Itachi, because as scary as Sasuke's eyes could be, Itachi's were far more dangerous. Because she knows the reason that Itachi is why Sasuke's gone, Sakura disregards Kakashi's instructions. She steps forward ahead of the group and looks straight into Itachi's eyes. Itachi doesn't shift or change. It's difficult to tell if he's impressed or bothered in any way by her courageous approach. His head tilts ever so slightly, and he mutters, impressive. The illusion he's attempted to turn on her runs aground, as he realizes Sakura herself is an illusion. She managed to trick for just a second the great, the brilliant, the genius Itachi. 
Explosive kunai fly from the trees beside him as the raging bull that is Sakura blasts towards him and winds up for a swing. The kunai fly past him and explode as he turns to thwart her clever assault, creating fire at his back. From within these flames, the real Sakura emerges, and this time it's faster than he can react, and she lands a blow on him. She straightens and dispels her clone, patting down the small burns on her clothes, only to realize there aren't any burns. Quickly, she surges her chakra and forces a warble of the illusion that Itachi managed to capture her in. With the small weakness exposed in the Genjutsu, she's able to dispel it altogether to rejoin the fray. As she snaps free from the Genjutsu, Naruto comes down on Itachi with his big Rasengan. Kakashi congratulates her on the distracting Genjutsu she cast, only asking for her to let him in on it in the future. A battle with a Genjutsu master like Itachi can make it difficult to distinguish between friendly and dangerous illusions. However, it is combined with her distraction that Naruto was able to make his assault with the Rasengan. When they make it to the hideout, Didara takes off with Gara, while Sasori stays behind to take care of Chio and Sakura. Though Chio has been constantly impressed by Sakura up to this point, she's still weary about whether the young lady would be able to keep up with Sasori. To her shock, Sakura tells Lady Chio that she'll lead the charge, despite knowing very little about her opponent. My Sakura has discarded her indecision and self-esteem issues, though I'd like to note that Canon Sakura is amazing here as well. It is one of my favorite fights in the entire series, to be honest. Lady Chio tells Sakura to hold back for just a moment so she can break down the majority of Sasori's abilities and to absolutely not underestimate the danger he poses. Sakura is perhaps too confident here. She takes a breath and we experience a flashback to a conversation she's had with Lady Tsunade. As a medical ninja, it is of utmost importance to evade injury throughout the length of a fight. But seeing as Sakura is a genjutsu type, Tsunade enlists the aid of Kuranai to teach Sakura how to enact genjutsu. While physical evasion is an incredible maneuver to master, projecting an illusion of oneself would allow one to be untouchable while still learning about the techniques of an opponent. In this way, Sakura could be helpful in more than simply medical ninjutsu for her team. Kneeling after a long moment, Sakura listens to Chiyo's strategy and gives her own feedback as well. As Sasori begins his needle barrage, increasingly offended that both are seemingly effortlessly dodging everything, he notices that some of his needles should have hit Sakura. Before he solves this predicament, Sakura sneaks up behind him and smashes his Hiruko puppet into pieces. Chiyo attaches chakra strings to Sakura and pulls her to safety as Sasori's true form emerges and he summons his human puppet of the third Kazekage. As the human puppet shoots its thousand arms and poison gas at Sakura, it also shoots its grappling ropes to root Sakura in the gas. But these ropes miss their mark, as Sakura is not in the gas but standing beside Lady Chiyo. Sasori curses that she managed to catch him in her blasted genjutsu again and begins planning ahead for just such a thing to happen again. Sakura recalls that Kuranai told her never to overuse genjutsu. Unlike the Uchiha clan, who could make nearly perfect genjutsu indistinguishable from reality, most couldn't. A skilled enough opponent would start seeing through a normal genjutsu even if they've fallen for it once or twice. From here on out, Sakura cannot rely on it but she's learned enough from it already. The puppet battle begins, and the human puppet produces the iron sand that Lady Chio fears. Sakura smiles at it, and her eyes light up. Lady Chio shouts for Sakura to stay back as the former Kazekage begins to fly at them. Sakura tells Lady Chio that she has no reason to but for her to trust. Sakura charges to meet the puppet head-on, and as the iron sand shoots out towards her, it suddenly loses momentum and falls harmlessly to the ground. Before Sasori can pull the Kazekage puppet back, Sakura throws an uppercut that shatters the puppet into hundreds of unusable pieces. Via her own Keke Genkai, she was able to disrupt the flow of chakra that controlled the sand, disabling the threat of the puppet entirely. Yet again, Lady Chiyo is dumbfounded. A medical ninja with Tsunade's strength, skills in Genjutsu, and a Keke Genkai? Where on earth could someone find such a uniquely talented ninja? Rather than feeling impressed by Sakura's collection of talents, Lady Chio feels, for just a moment, fear that someone could come along and surpass the already monstrous Tsunade. 
When I look back at the time skip, I don't think it's at all controversial to say that Naruto grew the least, Sasuke grew the most, and Sakura was somewhere in the middle. However, when you consider their individual goals and past failures combined with their growing talent, I thought it would make the most sense if Sakura had the most growth. Don't get me wrong, Sasuke's growth is still great, but to close the gap, Sakura needed to have come the furthest. An analogy could perhaps be like the tortoise and the hare. Sasuke's the hare, Sakura's the tortoise. By the end of the time skip, she's won the race, but oh so barely. Disappointed in the destruction of his human puppet, Sasori wastes no time in pulling out his hundred puppets. The conclusion of this fight is mostly the same, except any time a puppet gets near Sakura, she uses her Keke Genkai to either disrupt Sasori's connections to the puppet, causing them to either lose power altogether, or lose control in a couple limbs. In this exchange, neither Sakura nor Lady Chio gets poisoned due to Sakura's tricks. When the groups reunite around Gara's body, Lady Chio decides to sacrifice her life to save his. I thought in canon it was sort of cheap that Lady Chio got hit with deadly poison and then just happens to decide to save Gara. Instead, I wanted her to make the sacrifice despite being in good health. Surely that would make a greater impact than if she were already dying. After Naruto offers his own chakra to help the jutsu, Sakura kneels beside Chio and whispers to her that she can help. Lady Chio stops her, knowing that with this mysterious Keke Genkai she might be able to use external chakra to prevent Chio from dying. She says that by all rights she should have died against Sasori, and if not by him, miserably by herself in the village, resenting the world. Despite hushed protests from Sakura, Lady Chio refuses absolutely and passes away to save Gara. Now Sakura is confused. She just fought tooth and nail alongside Lady Chio as they protected each other from death. They could help each other now for the same reason, and she still refused. Almost like glass walls, Sakura feels her younger, powerless self trying to creep into her thoughts. She trained so hard for so long so that she wouldn't have to fail at anything. Tsunade trained her to prepare for inevitable losses, but this one wasn't inevitable. This was Lady Chio choosing her way out as honorably as she could. Sakura tells herself that she could still do much more in the future. Next time there won't be a need for such a sacrifice. Next time she'll be stronger yet. As Chio was the sole user of this jutsu, it wasn't very well refined. Though it brought Gara back to life, he did not have any strength to move. Kneeling beside him, Sakura places a hand over his forehead and uses a combination of medical ninjutsu and chakra siphoned through her Keke Genkai from Naruto to restore Gara's strength. Back in Konoha, Sakura is debriefed by Tsunade and expresses her frustrations about Chiyo's stubbornness to accept help. Tsunade explains that those who are so old are stuck in the previous era. To them, it is most honorable to die on a mission rather than peacefully in their homes. Tsunade tells Sakura that if a younger person tries to brashly sacrifice themselves like that in the future, Sakura has full permission to step in. Before she leaves, Tsunade gives Sakura a small box and congratulates her. If there was any question left in the camaraderie between the sand and the leaf, Sakura eliminated that altogether. She not only offered aid to Konkuro, a jonin of the sand, and shared the cure with the medical team, but she aided one of their most senior Kanoichi in bringing down a most wanted individual of their village, Sasori. And finally, she was instrumental in restoring Gara to strength. With the commendations from the sand and thanks for Sakura, Tsunade uses this mission to officially promote her to Jonin. She had her education finished since long past. Tsunade had just been waiting for Sakura to prove her worth on the field. Within the box handed to her are a set of five polished kunai, each made of a special metal so that they are easily infused with chakra. Sound familiar? Sakura thanks Tsunade for her tutelage and slips the five kunai into her tool bag right away. Tsunade nods approval and tells Sakura that there is just one technique she has left to finish teaching her, but it is the most complex of them all. Though Kakashi is crippled in the hospital from conveniently overusing his Sharingan, Sakura is able to help bring him back to health. With a fount of chakra at her disposal, with Naruto as her medium, she's able to rejuvenate Kakashi completely. Yamato is sadly removed from this mission, though he will make an appearance later on. I made this choice because of so many reasons, to be honest. 
I like Yamato just fine, but as part of his first mission with Team 7, he's extremely passive. Additionally, they're heading out to investigate Orochimaru, and between Kakashi personally knowing what Sasori acted like, and knowing how Orochimaru behaves, it was an easy answer. Also, in canon, this is rather ham-fisted. Kakashi goes on to use his Mangekyo a great many times without trouble later, so the inconsistency here bugs me so much. Finally, and most chiefly, there is no reason why Sakura wouldn't be able to bring Kakashi back to health with her unique gift. However, though Yamato is out, Sai is still in. To Sai, Yamato would certainly be a mystery. But Kakashi is extremely well known in the village, especially for his past accomplishments. And perhaps with this knowledge of Kakashi, Sai would end up less disagreeable to the team. Less, but still a little bit, because Sai is crazy and super awkward. With the pride of her new Jonin rank, Sakura isn't phased by Sai's rudeness, shocking Naruto, who seems to be the sole person that hates Sai. At the start of their mission to meet with Sasori's contact, Kakashi turns and congratulates Sakura on her promotion much to the shock of Naruto and Sai. Kakashi aside, at this point in the story, Sai doesn't really have a high opinion of anyone. All the research he could have done on these two would have been their missions and rank. To learn that Sakura is a Jonin would definitely increase her respect for her immediately. Not that this means much for Sai at the start. Naruto, however, is humbled by the news. In the time that he was away training with Jiraiya, he realizes that Sakura was still doing all her shinobi duties, learning and completing missions with other teams. She'd done so much in his absence that he feels a huge swell of pride for her progress, as well as a surge of energy for his own improvement. He tells Sakura that when they get back to the village, he'll buy her a big dinner with all their friends to celebrate. At the Tenchi Bridge, Kabuto reveals himself along with Orochimaru soon after. My Sakura is much more cautious. She's not actually on the bridge in formation with her team. That's another one of her illusions. As per her teachings, she wants to avoid damage and evade notice if she can help it. Ironically, this makes her act more like a stereotypical ninja than the rest of them who just jump into plain sight. Tomato, tomato. And obviously Orochimaru sees through this, but to him, she's no threat. And this isn't to say that Orochimaru is better at sensing illusions than Itachi, but more that Orochimaru expects an ambush and Itachi wasn't. He remembers what she can do, but the day of claiming Sasuke's body grows ever nearer, and his curiosity in others' abilities tends to wane leading up to a body swap. And aside, I have no idea if this is true, but it definitely makes logical sense to me. Though Orochimaru taunts Naruto with words of Sasuke, it is Kakashi that takes the offensive. He asks for Sakura to lend him extra chakra for what he is about to do, and she again uses Naruto as a conduit. All these times that she borrows chakra from Naruto, I'd like to note that it doesn't even affect him. Naruto is like a star made of chakra for Sakura. It allows them to work more cohesively than anyone else. He thinks if he can engage Orochimaru and draw him away, it will help quell Naruto's growing rage. Kakashi isn't dumb enough to think he can fight on equal ground with Orochimaru, but he stands a better chance than anyone back on the bridge. Orochimaru doesn't even take him seriously at first, dodging attacks and jumping backward playfully, but Kakashi currently has at least twice the reserves he normally has. A few fireballs erupt from within the forest as the two disappear into its depths. Unfortunately, Kabuto is amused by the effects of Sasuke's name on Naruto, and chooses to continue taunting. Sai stands and approaches Kabuto, handing him some previously hidden papers Donzo had given him. Sai's logic is that with Kakashi and Orochimaru in the heat of battle, he wouldn't have much other chances to realign himself. Kabuto tells him that if he's serious, then to step aside and wait for Orochimaru to return. Much to Sakura's chagrin, Sai walks to the other side of the bridge and waits patiently while Kabuto continues to tease Naruto. Sakura feels overwhelming waves of chakra flowing freely from Naruto as his chakra cloak grows its third tail. He's on all fours now, and Sakura notes that he looks somewhat like a beast. It's no time at all before that fourth tail emerges and his skin begins to peel away. Sakura tries rushing to his aid, confused as to what's happening to him, but Kabuto surprisingly gets in her way. He tells her that Naruto right now is even more dangerous to her than Kabuto is. She ignores him, 
shoving him with enough force that he begins falling into the ravine. With Kabuto out of her way, Sakura throws down a chain of Tsunade's specialized kunai. She links a chakra stream through them to connect to Naruto from a safe distance. Immediately, Sakura feels the invasive chakra surge back through the connection and into her. She can feel the violence of the Nine Tails swelling within, disrupting her own chakra network and almost taking it over. Trying to break off the connection, Sakura is in such a state that she no longer recognizes where she is. It's dark and gloomy, and she feels like she can hear Naruto shouting in the distance. She's walking through a flooded hallway, hands reaching through the dark for walls to guide her. The hall opens into a gigantic room, and she sees Naruto curled into a ball in the middle of the room, great jail bars stretching just beyond. She tries to see beyond the darkness to what lurks behind the bars when... She's pulled awake by Kakashi, who is rather worse for wear, but otherwise alright. Sakura is fiercely panting, and she feels... odd. Kakashi asks her what happened. From his perspective, Orochimaru faded into the shadows after playtime was over. When he returned, all he saw was an unconscious Naruto and Sakura, and no side to be seen. I don't think Orochimaru is so singularly focused on destroying the leaf that he's going to be actively killing every leaf shinobi he sees. I think he'd be more amused by these kinds of interactions than enraged. Sakura can barely make heads or tails herself, thinking that she'd only been out of it for a few seconds at the most. Nonetheless, she recounts the events of what happened on their side of things. Kakashi warns Sakura not to try whatever she had any more. Not to Naruto, at least. If Naruto were so near such a violent transformation again while Kakashi was not present, it would be safer to flee and allow him to transform. Sakura nods distantly, her mind still feeling cloudy. They wait for Naruto to reach consciousness and return to his old self, and then they head to Orochimaru's hideout. As Sasuke and Sai clash, the room they're in bursts outward, exposing it to the outside. Hearing the explosion, Naruto and Sakura go running. Unlike before, Naruto gets there first, with Sakura behind. She's no longer muddled by her previous connection to Naruto, but she's still disconcerted by it, and this has distracted and slowed her slightly. In a mirrored reaction, Sakura sees Naruto's face change and silence fall, as he realizes Sasuke is standing on the ledge above. Sakura has been doing a lot of research in these two years. As much information as is public, she learns both about Orochimaru and the Uchiha clan. Given the passion that the Uchiha clan is known for, she realizes that Sasuke won't be up for a simple talking to. In order to get him back to the village, they're going to have to make him come back. She pulls two kunai from her pouch and throws them forward in an arc. Just as they're about to hit Naruto, they collide with each other, diverting their directions. One kunai flies into the wall behind Naruto, while the other flies in the general direction that he's facing. The kunai in the wall is one of the polished blades that Lady Tsunade gifted Sakura, and she's able to discern Sasuke's approximate location via its reflective surface. Cocking a fist, she tells Kakashi to guard himself and stay back as she throws an upward thrust at the wall beside them, causing a secondary explosion. This time, debris fires at Sasuke, even as Sakura transforms herself into a piece of this rubble that's coming his way. He takes minimal action to avoid the falling rocks and looks down at Kakashi where the explosion originated, his eyes narrowing with arrogance. Even at this distance, Sasuke's keen eyes can see Kakashi has the Mangekyo shouting gun activated. Before he thinks to confront Kakashi about how he obtained such power, Sakura ambushes him from behind. Before Sakura realizes, Sasuke's drawn his blade and her attempt to sneak up on him from behind leads to her impalement. Your genjutsu is weak, Sakura. Sasuke claims nonchalantly as the genjutsu he stabbed disappears and reveals the real Sakura still safely behind. He turns the maneuver back on her with his Sharingan activated, but Sakura sees this coming and dispels it before he can take any action against her. I was able to break Itachi's. I can break yours, she taunts, caught up in the excitement of the duel. Sasuke's stony face betrays him for a moment of fury, and he conjures a Chidori intent on her. It's all Sakura can do to block the blow, catching his hand with hers, implementing her Keke Genkai to weaken the Jutsu. She swipes one of the specialized kunai near it, and the remainder of the Chidori's power absorbs into the blade. They separate for a moment and begin exchanging taijutsu. 
Sasuke notices that his strikes don't quite hit her as hard as they should, and indeed, with additional focus, sees a thin layer of oddly covered chakra across her skin. For a moment, while the two are in an interchange, Sakura feels a swell of excitement and joy. Not for holding her own, but for the smile Sasuke's giving her right now. Naruto and Sai are in disbelief that Sakura is trading strikes with Sasuke without need for help. Naruto in particular is no longer humbled, but wondering what the point of the last two years were for him. He has fallen so far in the shadows of both Sakura and Sasuke. Kakashi leaps into action as Orochimaru and Kabuto expose themselves. Kabuto turns to face Kakashi, and the latter decides that, without the element of surprise, they were completely outclassed here in Orochimaru's territory. Orochimaru stops Sasuke's hand, and Kabuto lands a sneaky strike on Sakura, knocking her off the ledge towards Naruto and Sai, Kakashi springing to her side to ensure a safer landing. As the three vanish into nothingness, Sakura stands free of Kakashi and screams almost adulation that through it all, without Orochimaru's intervention, she might have stood a chance. She was so close. When she finds Sasuke next, she'll definitely succeed. Unlike canon, she's not crying here. She is full of hope. Meanwhile, Naruto, as in canon, just crumples in self-pity. The intent was for Sasuke to exchange words with Naruto while they're in the clearing without Sakura, and for him to exchange fists with Sakura. In this way, he'd be able to get a little personalized reunion with both of them. And let's face it, she doesn't do anything here canonically, and the two of them are too caught up in their feelings to rationalize Sasuke's state of mind. My Sakura's well-read and well-taught. This isn't just a strong showing for Sakura, I wanted Tsunade to also shine as the best teacher of the Sanin. Jiraiya is my favorite character in the whole story. But if he was a better teacher, we wouldn't have all the great fights with Pain, or the goofiness with his research. Orochimaru isn't even a teacher. He's just conditioning Sasuke's body for eventual possession, like the creep he is. Speaking of which, we get a brief aside where Sasuke turns to Orochimaru after they've left. Though he's normally rude and nonchalant when it comes to Orochimaru, this time he's downright angry that his fight with Sakura was interrupted. He tells Orochimaru that there was no way she'd win, so why jump in there? Orochimaru saw that Kakashi was nearby and definitely dangerous enough to overpower Sasuke, and despite having Kabuto for medical aid, was more concerned with Sasuke staying in tip-top shape. Scoffing at the reason, Sasuke turns to Kabuto and tells him with a menacing finality, You won't touch her again before we fade to black. Back at the village, Sakura gives Tsunade her own version of events to Tsunade's shock. Tsunade is shocked because she thought Sakura would be able to overpower Sasuke. For this Sanin, it wasn't even a question. She tells Sakura to be at ease even in this loss. With someone like Kabuto at Orochimaru's beck and call, it was possible for him to enhance Sasuke further with medicines or forbidden jutsu. Sakura refutes this. She thinks Sasuke would be too resolute in his beliefs to accept such an easy handout. As Naruto and Sakura begin their departure from the Hokage's offices, Sakura teases that Naruto promised a meal for her. Quiet and sullen, Naruto says maybe another time, and walks home alone. Despite the personalized training he was just promised by Kakashi, he just can't get out of his head how far Sakura has come in comparison. He doesn't feel like he can stand beside her anymore. He's only surrounded by people who are way better than him. Naruto's a pretty positive guy, and he knows a time in his life when he wasn't even close to being the best ninja. But after training alone with a signing for over two years, he thought he was much more impressive than he was. He doesn't really hold this against Jiraiya, it's just a yearning for what could have been. And look, you might be thinking that I've advanced Sakura way too far in so little time. But like I said, this is the growth from the last two years. I wanted to accomplish a few things at first. I wanted Sakura to be made into a Jonin early on as a result of her continued missions, proven adaptability, and strengthening ties between nations. The final jutsu she's looking to finish from Tsunade is of course her Sozo Saisei. The growth from Naruto and Sasuke for the remainder of this series is so unbelievably explosive that Sakura needed to start at a much higher level to properly compete later on. Stay tuned for the next installment when I update this further. Look forward as well to the sinister chakra she has accidentally absorbed from Naruto. 
It looks like Shippuden will take a little longer to get through because, let's face it, there's a lot more that happens here. Because the next couple arcs are Naruto and Sasuke focused, I might be able to conclude this in one or two more videos. Until then, please give me time to properly plan them out. In the interim, I've got other videos planned that aren't necessarily Naruto focused, but if you do want more Naruto stuff, please share ideas. I've got one more rewrite idea for Naruto at the moment that would be mostly just for laughs. But like I said, still just an idea. I'm open to other manga and anime as well. Though I haven't exactly kept up with current stuff, there's a lot from the 90s, 2000s, and 20 teens that I've watched. I do plan to be a more broad spectrum channel, diversifying into other manga and anime, not just Naruto. I have a lot of controversial takes for some explosively popular anime, and that too is something I wish to eventually cover. The sky's the limit.